Notre Dame is number one. Notre Dame with a miracle win is a He's going again. Notre Dame has scored. Afternoon. Uh, met with the team yesterday uh, in our normal uh, fashion. We got out and ran the guys around, uh, weight train meetings. Uh, Monday for us is, uh, is a mental day. We put, uh, we put Michigan State behind us. So I'll talk in terms of what we did yesterday, and that was uh, talk about uh, the things that we did very well uh, as a team, and that's first and foremost, we won the football game. Uh, but also that uh, there's a lot of things that we've got to get uh, uh, to a newer level and a higher level, and, and that's really what we focused on yesterday was, uh, you know, the things that we exhibited as, as, a, as a football team, uh, mental toughness, uh, you know, controlling the line of scrimmage, outstanding special teams, uh, solid tackling, and, and carry that forward. Um, and that's all we're carrying forward. Uh, the rest is, is back to work. Uh, today will be an uh, intense Tuesday for us. Um, we're excited about the matchup with Michigan, um, as is the case with each game that we play. Uh, it's a red letter game on, on everybody's schedule and certainly a game that uh, we're looking forward to as well. It's here at home, um, you know, a nationally televised game on NBC. So all those things are important, but uh, I'd say the thing that I would, you know, want to talk about more than anything else is just that we have to continue to grow as a football team. Um, and, and our guys know how they got to this point. They just have to um, continue to commit themselves to getting better and we'll, we'll start on that today. Um, you know, we've got a lot of great individuals. As a matter of fact, uh, today uh, uh, we were informed that uh, Mike Golick Jr. Uh, was named to the All-State AFCA Good Works team uh, for his work in the community. Uh, great young man. We've got a lot of guys that do a lot of great work in the community, but he was singled out for his work in particular and uh, says a lot about the guys we have on our football team. With that, I'll open up to questions. Coach, you came here with a, an offense first reputation, but clearly you built this team from the defense out. Can you kind of describe what was the impetus behind that? What, what led you to that strategy? Well, I think I said it in my opening press conference when I took the job here is that it was important that if we wanted to compete nationally, uh, we had to have a defense that uh, you know could control uh, the the different teams that we play on a week to week basis. I don't think there's more of a uh, a diverse group of opponents that any team in the country plays. You know, when you play in a conference, you get a, gate, a great understanding of who you're playing. We're playing option teams, we're playing power teams, we're playing spread teams. So getting our defense up to that level through recruiting, through player development, through scheme, uh, has been job one. It's getting better and better each and every year. Uh, and, and we're lagging a little bit offensively, but we're making progress there. Is that an unusual feeling for you to have a team that you're working with the offense that's relying a little bit on the defense? Um, no, I think there's different plans in, in how you're successful. Um, and, and I knew when I took the job here at Notre Dame, um, you know, the, the blueprint for success here was different than, than other stops that I had along the way. And, and so um, I just think that every opportunity presents different challenges. This one uh, was to, to get our defense right. Thanks, Coach. Brian, to your left, could you comment on um, Everett Golson's play up to this point in terms of his football instincts after the snap, just his ability to see things and make plays after the ball's been snapped? Well, I'd say, first of all, I think we all know that he's, he's very skilled, but he's also very smart. He just doesn't have a lot of experience. So, you know, translating that classroom knowledge onto the football field is, is the process that we're in. And uh, sometimes he's a little bit late in those those, those reactions, sometimes he's too much pre-snap. Other times, uh, you know, we feel like he does some things that you can't teach. So it's an evolutionary process of uh, just getting more and more uh, opportunities to play this game. What we've asked him to do is, is uh, throw away the football, you know, and, and he's able to get out of the pocket and, you know, our completion percentage is, is, is probably taking a hit, uh, but our ability to succeed at the end of the day and win games has not. Um, and, and that's why I think he continues to, 
to, to evolve because he knows now um, that if he wants to stay in a starting lineup, he's, he's, he's got to take care of the football. So pre-snap, very smart. Post-snap, it's, it's a process uh, for him, and, and I think he'll continue to get better at more games he plays. Did he improve pre-snap this past week, or was that kind of offset by the way that you had to signal in plays with the wristbands? We saw improvement. We, we definitely saw improvement from Purdue uh, to Michigan State. And, and again, we don't want to give him a ton of things. If Tommy's out there, you know there's a lot of checks. There's a lot of different things going on. We don't ask him to do all those things either. He's capable of doing what we ask him to do, uh, but he doesn't have all the experience that Tommy has yet. So um, he can do some things that Tommy couldn't do either. So it's, it's kind of that trade-off that we're in right now. Has he... I've heard a couple announcers make comments about receivers being open and missing receivers. I don't mean overthrowing, but not seeing them and finding them. In three games, how has he done in terms of finding open receivers? You know, I'd say that, uh, you know, if you look at the Michigan State game, we feel like he, he saw the open receivers. He, he overthrew two of them. Um, but, I mean, again, I, I think if, if we're really looking at Everett Golson, the player, he's in there for a reason. <laughs> he's he's going to miss some of those things, and he's going to continue to grow. I'm looking for improvement each week, and I, I've got to see tangible improvement from him. And it's not just on Saturday. It's in practice. It's how he goes to meetings. It's film study. It's taking care of himself, and we're seeing the kind of improvement um, that, that I need to see for him to continue to be the starter. How did Danny Spahn play? Does he give you something that you don't have there or haven't gotten from that position? You know, he's a big physical kid, you know, almost 250 pounds, so he, he can anchor the edge. You know, if the ball gets out on the perimeter, you know, he's, uh, he's a big guy in space, but he certainly sets the edge for us and gives us a guy with, uh, you know, uh, that physical presence at that position. And Ben, Ben uh, Council got some more work uh, against Michigan State and continues to improve at that position as well. We talked about signature wins over the weekend. When you were at Cincinnati, can you point to one game, Rutgers first year, um, at West Virginia second year? Did you have that kind of demarcation? Like, Yeah, I, I think each year, Oregon State in the first year probably, um, West Virginia in the second year, probably Rutgers in the third year. I think each year you have some of those kinds of wins that kind of set you in a direction. Uh, it only means one win, you know. We're three and zero. We didn't give out any rings yesterday to anybody, um, so we've got a long way to go, um, you know, towards that end. And looking back now that you can look back after a, a big win on Saturday, did the Ireland trip in any way? And I know you said it didn't matter, and you put it behind you, but did it in any way impact the way you played against Purdue? No, I don't think so. Thank you. I was going to ask about Spawn, but just mentally, how has he responded to you know the uncertainty earlier this season, and just being able to go out there? Well, I think he responded to it by the way he came back and practiced, uh, you know, after after you know having some of those uh, migraine issues. I think once you make that decision to put the gear on and go back out to practice, you've handled it, you know, and and he. He pushed the envelope. He was the one who wanted to get out there. Um, and so I think we had no hesitation of practicing him and playing him because of the way he handled it leading up. He wasn't, oh, I, I don't know if I should play. It's always been, once I'm cleared, I'm going to play. And so I think he handled that before he even got into game week. At risk of playing up the whole revenge angle a little too much, how much do these guys talk about the last drive last year, just the way things have ended against Michigan the last couple of years, or is it they don't you talk try to about play it. the same way? <laughs> they don't talk about it at all. And they, they just want to win. They, they, they just want to win games. And there's not much that we reflect back on 2011. You know, there's, there's nothing really to reflect back on other than experiences gained for the positive. Um, Everything is, is pretty much, you know, focused on getting better individually. And if we do that, there's no need to reflect back on what happened last year. A little off topic, to, to win a night game on the road like that on what was a big home recruiting weekend for Michigan State, what, what are some of the benefits and future implications for you guys to do that? Haven't really given that much thought. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're my mo Monday was just like every other Monday. I'm making phone calls. I'm, uh, you know, 
breaking down film. Nothing seems to have changed. I don't want anything to change. I just want to continue to execute on Saturday and continue to play good football. But I got to tell you, there's, 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 uh, there's no different feeling other than we're back to work. Brian, up here, just talk about Zeke Mata's leadership, how you've seen him develop, uh, not only against Purdue, getting Elijah lined up, but yeah. then moving forward without Jamor. Well, he gets more than Elijah lined up. He, he gets him. You know, it's, I, I'm glad you brought it up because it's probably one of the most remarkable, um, I think, developments of a player from year one or year two to year three in, in that sense. He had a hard time getting himself lined up last year. Um, he has been terrific back there. He's been physical. He's played the ball well. Uh, and his leadership skills have continued to grow. He was a young man that um, at times was, uh, had a hard time speaking in front of a group. Uh, this spring I had him speak at our spring uh, banquet. Um, along with uh, Justin Tuck, handled himself well there. And it's just been a great evolutionary process to see him continue to grow as a person and as a player. And he, he deserves uh, all the credit for that. I remember talking to him and like Harrison and some of the other guys after the bowl game, and that was kind of one of the bright spots they felt like, that a, a game like Zeke played against Florida State was something that was just going to snowball. And it sounds like you've seen that happen. When, how quickly did you know that, OK, that that wasn't just a flash. That's something that's going to have staying power for The him. spring really showed us a lot, I think, in terms of his play, and in particular, taking over and being a leader. He's also on our unity council. We saw that coming. Hopefully, the, the, that, that game maybe gave him a little bit more confidence, um, and it gave him an opportunity with Harrison graduating, and he's taking great advantage of it. Tim asked about the wristbands. Is that something you can continue, or is that road night uh, some familiarity with... Uh, Lorenzo Guest being there. It, it was a lot to do with the signals possibly being compromised. I mean, is it something you th would be beneficial to continue or, or no? I mean, if you take away the first two plays of the game where some guys were on line eight and we were calling line seven, um, I think they settled down. I wouldn't take it off the table. Um, I don't know that that's the way we're going to operate moving forward, but we'll, we'll keep it as a, as a possibility. Uh, this week, obviously, Denard Robinson has uh, been pretty effective against you guys the last two years. What do you think you guys as have, a have staff have, have learned there um, and from your experience of the last two years? Well, I thought we did a pretty good job, really, for three quarters. Um, you know, I, I think that if there's a couple of plays we'd like to have back in the passing game, maybe. Um, but uh, I, we liked our plan. Um, we think that we're physically a better football team that, that, than, than we were the previous couple of years. He's a superior football player. He is, he's a difference maker. And so, you know, we have to find a way to uh, limit big chunk plays, just like we have the first few weeks. It's about our defense not giving up those big chunk plays. We gave them up in the running game in year one, and we gave them up in the passing game in year two. We have to eliminate and control those big plays uh, that are out there. If we do that, we feel pretty good. This might sound strange, but from year one to year two, do you feel like schematically you got a better handle on it and it just happened to be some bizarre chunk plays at the end of the game? That yeah, I mean, they hit it. I mean, we're, we're in double coverage. You know, we got two guys going up for the ball and they come down with it. And, you know, um, we got into some one on one matchups that didn't turn out our way. Um, the numbers are, are ridiculous in terms of how many great plays we had, but that's the game of football. You've got to eliminate those, those big chunk plays, and, and that's obviously something that we're working hard on this week. And just a quick injury run on, uh, you know, DeVaris, you said of the setback. Do you feel like yeah. he's still on, on track? And then Sheldon as well? Yeah, they're, they're both making progress to play this week. Um, I, I don't know how that's characterized. I think in the NFL they say probable. Those guys are probable. Brian, right over here. When Jim Morris goes out and you've got to put Matthias back in there, how much does that limit your flexibility with the idea of bringing that safety down to be that sort of extra linebacker? Does that almost 
take it off the board in ways, or do you work around it, or how do you work around it? I don't think you can play that way, really, Brian. If if you're if you're that limited at the safety position, you got to find somebody else. He played close to the ball uh, against Navy and played very well um, for a first start. You know, so we feel comfortable that he's played close to the ball. He's got really good ball skills. We like him off the hash. Um, he's just got to play more. You know, he's just got to continue to gain experience back there. Jamoris was a an experienced veteran. We're losing a, a, a great piece there. But I don't think you can limit yourself in that respect that you can't spin a guy down from his position or you're going to get taken advantage of. And there's a report out there, a couple of reports yesterday, that uh, Notre Dame and UConn might be talking about a game at Fenway Park. I just saw that. I just saw that. You know me. I'm a, I'm, I love Fenway Park. Um, I just don't know if it's big enough. You know, we don't want to get into that Northwestern Illinois game where the end zone's not big enough. So, uh, as long as they do the due diligence, and I know Jack uh, is looking for great venues, and I don't think they played a game there in a long time. Um, if it's on the schedule, we're going to play it. Being a Boston guy, uh, baseball hasn't been very good there, so maybe we we'll bring some football. Yeah, personally, I mean, given that you have a particular affinity for the team that plays there in that venue, would that be an exciting thing for you, that opportunity? I think it'd be cool. Yeah. I'd like, I'd like to do it, but uh, I mean, I think more than anything else, it's, I don't know the ramifications of the f 2014 schedule as it relates to ACC scheduling and all those kinds of things. That's, I've been so focused <laughs> on getting to the office today. Brian Centerfield, um, first of all, in the Michigan State game, you mentioned the trouble at the beginning of the game. After the troubles there, you called the timeout. What do you say to your team? I laughed. I was laughing. <laughs> I know you guys find it hard to believe that I laughed during a game, but I was actually laughing because we called the first play as a huddle. We were huddled up. It was just jitters. It was jitters. They, uh, one guy didn't, we tagged the first play with the number of the guy that's supposed to be out there. And he didn't look at his number, I guess, or forgot what his number was. The second one was a veteran player of ours just got lost in the moment. So we had some jitters and it wasn't even the quarterback's fault. Um, so it was just one of those things, you just gotta take a moment, take a deep breath, and, and after that we, uh, we played pretty good. As you look at film of Michigan, obviously Alabama did a great job against Denard. He's played much better in the last two games. Have they changed anything from game one that they're doing schematically, or is that more a tribute to Nick's defense? No, I think it was attributed to getting up on them, too. You know, they got up on them, got some scores on them, uh, got them behind the chains a few times, and, and then, you know, they had some opportunistic turnovers. So, um, you know, Alabama's a great football team. I'm not taking anything away from them, but Michigan does what they do, and, and uh, Denard Robinson is still a dual threat. And he'll play his best against us. We're prepared for that. As you look at your offense, Sierra got 10 carries the other day, 56 yards. How much of a factor was it having him back? Obviously, it complicates things. You got to get, try to get everybody touches. But how much does it help to have him back in the mix? Well, I think the implications are more about being fresh in the fourth quarter. He had fresh legs. He hadn't played in a couple of weeks. Uh, he didn't have a lot of carries leading up to the late, later carries that he got. He was aggressive, he was physical. He played like a guy who had a couple of weeks off. And, and I think that depth at running back is gonna allow us to keep turning those guys in and, and have four quarters of physical play at the running back position. And finally for me, Robbie Toma and John Goodman both emerging with big plays <laughs> and, and emerging as reliable players. Would you have expected that a year or two ago from them? Well, they weren't. <laughs> they weren't. They are becoming um, much more reliable, much more consistent uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and that, that credit goes to them. You know, they've, they've really taken to the understanding that they've got to be consistent in practice because we've got some competition. We've got some young guys that can fly out there. You know, they're not there yet, but um, there's some good competition at those positions. And, and for veterans and seniors, I'm really proud of the way they've taken to it and said, hey, I'm going to do it right all the time, and it paid off against Michigan State. Brian, following up on Toma, I mean, what did he do to to win you over? I mean, a, a lot of guys like that get recruited over and you never hear from them again. What did he do to kind of stay up there and kind of win you over? 
consistency. I, I think more than anything else, he, you know, he's a guy that you can rely on. And and we've got some young guys out there that, um, you know, sometimes uh, they're they're play is not as consistent as you would like. And you know what you're going to get from Robbie. You know, he's going to compete every snap. Um, he's a good blocker on the perimeter, and he'll catch the football throwing it to him. So I think consistency, more than anything else, is the, is the reason why he's gotten the kind of um, catches, because we've penciled him in to touch the ball because of what he's exhibited. We saw Chris Brown get behind the defense early in that game. What are what are you seeing from him in practice on a day to day basis? Uh, that he just continues to develop. Uh, he's got elite speed. He can get behind anybody. Uh, we just got to, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things that go to play in that position. You know, his split, his alignment, who's he's blocking, who is he blocking on a particular play, what kind of release, all those things. We're gonna live live through Chris's. Chris's development, but we know one thing: if we match him up one on one, you, you're going to have you're going to have some favorable outcomes on our end. It's just going to be a matter of time. One follow up on the injury situation: House Cap, he's fighting through it. You know, he's um, you know you know he's he's at that line of of being hurt, you know, and, and um, being injured, and he's a, he's a tough. Kid, he he fought through it on Saturday and had a big um, pressure on the quarterback late in the game. We'll be careful with him, but he'll answer the bell on Saturday and he'll be in there starting for us. Um, you know that that calf is one of those things that just uh, is a bit of a nagging injury. But we told him you got four or five days to get through it, and then you got uh, a bye week. So he's he'll he'll grind through it and be ready to go on Saturday. Last one for me. I saw that. Uh Salvi was on the printed depth chart. Mm -hmm. Is he the next guy that's going to be involved in the safety play? I there? think you're going to see Nicky Barati, CJ Procis, and you're going to see Salvi. Um, you know, you're going to see all those guys begin to get in the rotation. It's a long year. We can't count on, you know, just having two safeties for the rest of the year. So you're going to see a veteran at Salvi that can get guys lined up, that can line up himself, um, get the calls, um, be functional out there. Uh, He's a very good tackler, uh, and then get those young guys uh, moving forward. Brian, still on your right up here? Yeah. Um, going back to the receivers, was that maybe the TJ Jones that you saw when you first got here, an aggressive guy you trusted to be in the starting lineup right away? Yeah, I think, you know, for TJ, that was a big game for him uh, in that, um, again, we – targeted him on those play calls. We wanted the ball in his hands. And, you know, I think the one thing that Coach Martin's done a great job is, is when we're moving personnel in, you know, we're connecting with the right guys in the right situations. And so that personnel changes that you've seen so much of, um, you know, a lot of that has contributed to these guys knowing when they're going to get the football and what their play call is. And in that instance, um, you know, he's, he's been a, uh, a great catcher of the ball and getting yards after the catch. If you look at last year, um, did a great job against Purdue on a, on a drive route, Michigan last year. And so we're really trying to, to go to his strengths. You mentioned the various personnel groups you have. Is kind of this Theo Riddick playing receiver and now back at running back. It's almost one of the few triple threats you have. He's probably the most willing blocker we've seen back there in a while. Does he kind of open things up for two running backs at a time with his versatility? Oh, absolutely. It's a tough matchup group. You know, when you when you think of some of the formation groupings, if you've got two tight ends and two running backs on the field, but you're in no back, you know, it creates some some issues. And you know, we'll continue to utilize those multiple groupings. They they work well for us. And I'm sorry if this is answered Sunday. With Jamoris, is a, is a sixth year a possibility for him? Doesn't, it doesn't appear so. He did have another injury that caused him to miss some time. Um, we're still kind of vetting through all that um, right now. But um, the early indications, we couldn't, we couldn't tell you one way or the other. We'll, we'll do some more work and before we're ready to publicly comment on it. Did, did you know right away, it looked like Rob kind of said when you were coming off the field on TV, it kind of looked like... I saw him go down. That's why I walked out on the field. Coach, can you...
can you talk about the process that Mike Elston is using to develop guys like Sheldon Day and Springman and, and the young guys there? Mike has done an incredible job. You know, his focus is strictly on that defensive line room, Al. He was a special teams coordinator as well last year. And um, getting him focused just on that room, the personalities that are within that room, uh, and getting them all to understand they have a role uh, requires a great relationship with the players, it requires um, a coach that knows their strengths and is not afraid to go into a rotation. And those are all really huge dynamics that sometimes don't get looked that at a particular position group and I think you've got great buy-in on all of those guys in terms of knowing their roles and playing accordingly so um, couldn't be more happy with the, the progress we've made there with uh, which Co coach Elston is the, the lead of. Coach over here going back to Jim Morris quickly it's two Achilles in a month's time for this team it's kind of a, a rare injury I guess is that yeah. something you guys look into if there's a pattern there? Yeah, you know, I think if, if it was the same ankle that he had, you know, the issues with, maybe we could have said, hey, there were some structural issues there and that caused it was the other foot that has been healthy. Uh, and the way he went down, you know, he took three steps and went down. Um, I was referring more to the low wood injury. You got two guys with Achilles beat up in a, in a month. Is there a problem with the way they're stretching him or anything like that? No, I mean, I, I think... Uh, you know, it's definitely unusual to get two of them uh, in one year. Uh, I just think that, um, you know, fate played a hand in this one uh, because we, you know, we do all the things necessary to, to have those guys ready to go. And a quick question about Chase Hounschel wasn't uh, with you guys in East Lansing. Is he a guy you're trying to preserve a year for? Or is he banged up at all? Um, yeah, you know, he's, he's, he's played... Um, you know, w with a little bit of a shoulder. Uh, we think he's going to be ready to go this week. We want to kind of protect him a little bit. And, uh, but he'll be, he'll be uh, getting reps this week, and we'll see where that goes. And then lastly, just following up on the questions about Zeke, it was his development as a leader more just because he had a place to step in when Harrison was gone, or did you guys really have to force him out into that role? I think it was a little bit of that. I think there was definitely that I wanted to push him out front because I saw a young man that the way he practiced, the dedication he has to the game, the kind of young man he has, you want him representing your program. So we pushed him out there a little bit and he got into a, um, he got outside of that, that comfort zone a little bit, but he's a lot more comfortable with it. I think opportunity has helped him as well. And then he knows this is his last year and it's time for him. So um, I think all those things combined. Brian, to your right, you, you talked um, Sunday about how right after the game you talked about you got the focus on Michigan, and you started the news conference talking about that too. There's a lot of buzz around campus, so I'm sure. How, how do you what do you do this week to make sure that you know that that message stays with them the entire week that you know that they're not getting too high on themselves? Well, we have a sign that's that's. Uh pretty uh, visible for our guys to see when they walk in and walk out of the building. And it starts with, don't believe or fuel the hype. That's number one. Number two, manage expectations. Number three, avoid the noise. And four, speak for yourself. And they see that every single day. I put that up last year. I put that up last year, expecting, you know, that that was going to be something that we were going to have to deal with. And we're dealing with it right now. And, and they've seen that now for over a year and a half. They know what that sign means. And um, they know if they want to continue to be successful, they need to continue to do the things they're doing. You, you ran into the same thing at Cincinnati. Slightly different, though, because that was a program that had never been to this heights before. Is there any difference between you know, managing the players there and here or you do anything different or is it the same group of, you know, not the same group, but the same mentality for kids that age? Yeah, they're exactly similar in that neither one of these guys have been to those places before. Nobody in this room knows what, what it looks like. So um, it's, I'm handling it exactly the same way. And I don't know of any other way to do it. You know, and that is, you know, work on getting better. And, and we'll, we'll work on that this week. You talked about Sierra. Um, yeah. It seemed like he, he came, fresh or not, he came up with some key runs, clutch runs when you needed the most. Is that just his, his 
you know, what he does best, or do you think it was just taking advantage of the opportunity? No, I think he would tell you that that uh, he missed a couple of reads uh, that that should have uh, been some bigger runs, um, and he's happy we won. I, I would tell you that across the board. If I had Tyler Eifert in here, if I had a, any of the old linemen, they would say the first thing, and we asked them this: "Tell us about this weekend." And they all said, "We're happy we won, but." Here's what I've got to do better. If we can continue with that kind of mentality, we're going to be fine. When we start talking about, well, yeah, you know, that's, that's me. That's how I roll. You know, I'm that kind of player. You know, if it's all about them, we got some issues. Sear is now at that point where he understands that it's about the team. And when he gets his opportunity, um, he's got to help the team. Jack has been talking some about the the need to get the, the noise up at Notre Dame. I know you've been hesitant to talk about that, but can you just talk a little bit about what a difference a, a loud crowd can make? Well, are you fe this is coming from you, Eric, right? You just, fe <laughs> you just feed it, right? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, look, I, I continue to believe that if we play great football, if, if we do the things that we did against Michigan State, um, then then it's going to be plenty loud enough in that stadium, you know. Um, so that's really low on my priorities as to what I got to do each and every week. And final question for me: With Denard worrying about that, mm -hmm. with, with with Denard Robinson, do you do you have to uh, treat him? Do you, do you try to stop the pass first? Is that the biggest concern, or how do you how do you go about doing that? You know, if, if there was a secret out there, <laughs> you know, we, we, we would have probably gotten it way before anybody else. We've got great alumni out there. Uh, it's, it's a difficult proposition because you can't sell out on either one of those. You have to be balanced and you have to be able to manage it. And you've got to, you know, you've got to keep him from making big plays. So there isn't an easy answer to that. He's a superior football player. He's not a great player. He's the best player on the field. Brian over here, kind of building on what Tom was saying about the hype and the, the lead up to this game, you, you tell your players to try to like, avoid the noise and don't fuel it, but at the same time there's a positive to having that atmosphere on your side. So for you, where's the line in terms of allowing those guys to, to kind of use that to their advantage without getting on the wrong side of it? I think you're absolutely right. And my first comments were, how did it feel today getting patted on the back all day? Wasn't that nice? Wasn't that a nice change to go to class and not hear how bad you are or what you should have done or what you didn't do? They told you a lot of good things. Now, having said that, that's a good place to be. But here's what you want to do if you want to be there next week. Because let me tell you what, if you don't do that next week, you'll be back where you were you know, a few weeks ago. So uh, let's understand this. It feels good to be there, but how we got there, we, we need to continue to do these things. So I agree. You, you can't just say don't listen to, the, to those things. You want those things. You work for those. But you have to be able to keep it in, in balance and perspective. And the other thing, just when you think about the Notre Dame-Michigan rivalry, just kind of what comes to mind in terms of the type of football game, the type of atmosphere, and, and kind of everything surrounding it? The only thing that comes to mind is that we haven't beaten them the last two years, for me. You know, I, I wasn't part of the other games. I know it's a great clash. It's Notre Dame. It's Michigan. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's great college football. But for me, we haven't beaten them. That, that's, that's, that's what I remember about this series. We've talked about the liberal rotation you have along the defensive front line there, but you also seem to have it at outside linebacker, even at corner. How much of that do you attribute to the defense giving up only four first downs in the fourth quarter, uh, just not seeming to wear down and finishing strong? It's, it's central. It's central to uh, being able to play uh, that kind of football uh, for four quarters. It's having coaches that, that trust in their guys, that they're, they're doing the work during the week to, to get that opportunity. Because I will tell you this, if they don't practice right, Coach Diaco's not playing. They're not playing, period. So um, they've got to practice the right way, and if they're in the rotation, uh, he's going to play them. And I think that that's been a hallmark of, of how Bob has managed it, the personnel on the defensive side of the ball, and how each position group has, has developed accordingly to that overall plan. Because last year, 
RJ and Gary pretty much took almost, it seemed, every snap mm -hmm. at, at corner. How, the, de the development of the depth there, like with Atkinson and Shoemate and others, when did that trust really start to develop so much? With it, it's not just that. I mean, let's, let's be honest. You know, Manti doesn't come off the field. You know, Jared Grace is a good player. You know what I mean? So there's a little bit of, you know, there, there's, there's a bit of a separation there in, in terms of the talent level that, that uh, Harrison Smith had. Um, making it hard to get Zeke Mata on the field, and we all see how pretty good Zeke is. So some of it has to do with who is at that position. Um, but I think as a general theme, uh, we're much more committed to getting all those players valuable time because of the length and the depth of the schedule that we play. And we know we're going to need them at some time during the year. You talked a lot in the preseason about emphasizing to the quarterbacks that sometimes zero yardage is a good play and many times ever it did throw the ball away or that. Would you have preferred he take the sack on the play where he was about to be sacked and kind of let let it go? The one the that was ruled a non-interception or the one no. that we caught on the sideline? The sideline. <laughs> yeah, that, that one we had more of a problem with relative to decision making. The one we had a problem with on the, on the ball that he threw over the middle was he didn't have a good clock in his head on that play. You know, the pocket was going to break down on that type of protection about a second ago. So, uh, yeah, they were two different plays. That one, uh, he, he's got to make sure that that ball gets out of bounds. And just last one for me, you were one of 14 on third downs. Tyler didn't catch a pass. Do you sense almost a confidence level, though, that from the overall team that your All-America tight end doesn't catch a pass, you didn't have the success you had been used to on third down, and you can still come out with a pretty hefty win on the road against a quality defense? Yeah, because we didn't turn the ball over. Third down conversions are great. You know, you want third down conversions, but we were managed the game uh, in a manner that, um, you know, we had a great kicking performance. You know, and if we can kick that way, uh, third down conversions is not going to impact the football game. Um, it's turnovers. It's short fields. And it's the big chunk plays. I know you've heard this in ad nauseum, but the fact of the matter is the completion percentage will continue to get better. The third downs will continue to get better. Uh, we just need to take care of the football and keep our defense on a long field. Thank you. Coach up here. Yeah. Um, I believe this is your fourth time going against Brady Hoke. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it is. So uh, Two does, times at Ball State. Does that make it easier to prepare for a team or is it negated because it's easier for him as well? I mean, in, in terms of a wrestling match, he's as big as he's ever been. So he's still <laughs> going to beat me. My money's on him in that He's regard, still going to beat me on that one. He's a good coach. He, I respect Brady Hoke. And we go back uh, and, and battled out some really close games uh, when, when I was at Central he was at Ball State. I think if there's any history lesson is that uh, uh, we've had some great – great contests. Um, he's, a, he's a darn good football coach, but other than that, coordinators take on a personality of your football team and, you know, he's got, you know, uh, a different group of coordinators than he did at Ball State. We're probably a little bit more similar in that um, I've got coaches that are with me that were, were at Central Michigan with me. So his has changed, um, you know, quite a bit. Okay, so you you're do tend to do more of what you did at Central. and Yes, I think he would be more familiar and go, yeah, that looks like what Kelly does. Uh, and Brady's been great at, uh, you know, changing coordinators and adapting, but it still comes down to his personality. He wants to play, you know, tough, aggressive defense, uh, and, you know, he's going to find a way to run the ball. Did you... Uh before the game last year as you walked out and talked to him before the game. I, I, I don't know if you did, but a lot of times coaches do that. Did you guys kind of laugh that, hey, we're a long way from Mount Pleasant or Muncie? Or? I can't remember the conversation. I, I know the only thing I do remember is after the game, um, I, I think we, we did kind of exchange of we've been down this road before with close games. I, I can't remember what, what we really talked about 